Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about stress concentration. So we are going to have a stress concentration any time that we have some sort of discontinuity in the geometry. The discontinuity can be in form of change of diameter. If we have one section of our geometry or our beam with diameter D and then we go to a larger diameter. So we are going to have a stress concentrations in these regions. And the value of that stress concentration or the amount of the stress concentration depends on a lot of factor ratio of d over d and then if we have radius of curvature here we call it r r over d and there are tables that you could find the proper stress concentration factor the other form common form is that if you have a hole that hole can be open hole or closed hole when we are talking about closed hole we are talking about a geometry that we have fasteners, we have some sort of bolt and knots or rivets that is occupying that hole. So experiments have shown that when we are finding the stress for such geometries, let's say a very simple case of normal load being applied on our geometry with a hole, we have to find the stress here. F over A, it's the common uh, equation, then we have to use the reduced area because that's the area that the force is acting on. That's the critical region in our geometry. And that would be W minus D times the thickness, which is T. So if we find that stress and then apply loading, do experiments, apply loading, and then plot the stress strain curve, we would see the yield of the material is much lower than the yield that we know. So something is happening here. Either we did not calculate the stress correctly, either we cannot use this equation, or the strength value, our SY, would be different for such geometries. So either way, that would be a correct approach, whether we think of it as the reduction in a strength, or whether we think of it as a stress riser. But generally, it's assumed that we are assigning a coefficient to our stresses, and we call that coefficient kT. So our stresses are actually higher than what we normally see in the stress equations. And if you apply this coefficient, which is more than one, then we would see the failure at the yield point. And that's how we have observed experimentally that geometries with stress concentrations are failing at a lower value. So we have to make up with that by scaling them up, by assigning a coefficient. So here, the stresses are higher and that KT would be where the vicinity of the hole. So if I plot the stresses, as we go away from the hole, the stresses go get lower and lower until they reach a value of the average value. And then this one would be sigma max. Same thing for the other side of the hole. Stress concentration, the other name for it is a stress riser because we are multiplying a factor to increase our stresses. So if it's a normal load, we show it by kT, and normal stress can happen due to normal load or to bending moment. In each case, we are applying the corresponding stress concentration factor. You need to remember that the stress concentration factor is different for different loading. So it depends not only on the geometry, but this one is function of the loading as well. And it, because the equations are different, you know, here we have this, the area, here we have moment of inertia. So it's really not comparing apples to apples, but for two identical geometries, generally KT of normal load would be higher than KT value of the bending. So a stress concentration are more critical for normal stress due to normal force rather than the bending. Similarly for shear stress, 
We have a stress concentration. Shear stress can be caused by shear load or torsion. For torsion, because it's shear, it creates shear, we call it KTF. And then we can go to corresponding tables and find the value of a stress concentration. For shear load, we don't assign any stress concentration because shear load depends on the geometry at a specific location, wherever we look at the geometry, wherever we make our section cut. Unlike torsion or bending that depend on the, geom the overall geometry. So usually no stress concentration factor is applied when we are using shear stress caused by the shear load. But what about the fatigue stress concentration? So for fatigue stress concentration, it's a slightly different, but we are finding it based on the static stress concentration. In terms of fatigue, the load is changing. This load would have a profile. It's going from a minimum value to a maximum value. So we can find the corresponding stresses going from minimum to maximum. And then for fatigue, we decompose our stresses into the alternating component and the mid-range component. And the mid-range is just the average of the two stresses and alternating is the amplitude of, of our stresses. So the factor that we use is, we call it KF. So F denotes fatigue. And then we have the mid-range and alternating, we separated the two component. So the fatigue stress concentration, we don't have different tables for it. It depends on the static stress concentration and then the value of Q, which is material dependent. which determines how sensitive our material is to a stress concentration in terms of fatigue. Q is ranging from zero to one. So when Q is zero, if you look at this equation, when Q is zero, so KF equals one, means no stress concentration. Then we have maximum sensitivity, Q is one. So when Q is one, if we go back to the equation again, that would be one plus KT minus one, so that would be KT. So in the worst case scenario, the fatigue stress concentration is the same as the static stress concentration. And in the best case scenario, the stress concentration has no effect on, on our fatigue loading. So if you don't wanna go through the fatigue equations of a stress concentration, you can simply use the static stress concentration and you would be conservative because that's the maximum value a fatigue could have. And then if it's shear due to torsion, we call it KFS, and then we have a similar equation. Then instead of Q, we have QS here, and instead of KT, we have KTS. And then we find a stress concentration. But in a lot of cases, you want to find a stress concentration experimentally. In that case, you have to run two tests. Test one, we look, we have our sample, we find an unnotched specimen, we manufacture an unnotched specimen and do our testing and then find the stresses and then plot the stress strain curve and see whether it fails the yield or the strength of our unnotched specimens. And then we do the same testing for notched specimen. And then we find the corresponding stresses. Again, we are using a reduced area. And then we find the stresses, let's call them as notched and unnotched, so as N. And then here I can call it as unnotched. And the stress concentration would be the ratio of the two. So the stress concentration would be the strength of unnotched. So here the top, whatever value I find on the top, divided by the stresses of the notched. In experiments, we can find the strength, or we call it a stress to failure. With experiments, I cannot find the stresses. The stresses is a function of whatever equation I use. You know, experiments will give me a force displacement and then I use my own equation to change it to stresses. But it gives me the strength, the maximum value it can handle. So if I wanna find the stress concentration experimentally, I have to look at the value of strength 
and then we know that if the specimen is a notch the stresses are going to be higher so uh, the value in the numerator would be higher than the value in the denominator so kt is always more than one now let's look at if you want to look at different hole sizes if you look at the tables of a stress concentration I mean, for different geometries, you would see that, okay, you, the x-axis is d over d. Uh, for a case that we have uh, a hole here, and then you can find a stress concentration. So as the hole size gets smaller, so as we go here, as this fraction gets smaller, the stress concentration gets much higher, it means that our stresses are getting higher. So can we make a conclusion that between case one and case two, case two is better because the stress concentration here is much higher than the stress concentration here. Should we use a specimen with a larger hole size? Should we increase our hole size? Because we know if the hole size decreases here, the stress concentration, as this one decreases, the stress concentration increases. But in reality, we don't care about the stresses as much as we care about the load carrying capacity. So the strength to failure is the same when you apply the stress corresponding stress concentration factors. You have to look at the load carrying capacity of the two cases. That is true that for the, the first one, KT1 is much higher value, to, so the load would be less but also the area would be much higher. If you're using a large hole size, that means that you're reducing the area significantly. And if the area reduces significantly, therefore your force, your load carrying capacity would be reduced significantly. So we do not necessarily like, do not like large hole sizes, even though the stress concentration might be less. The other thing that we need to look at is the open hole versus the closed hole. Open hole is the, if you have a specimen with a, with a hole here and applying load, and here you have a specimen, but here the hole is filled with a fastener. Experiments have shown that the KT, the stress concentration, is much higher for the case of closed hole rather than the open hole case. And there are equations to find, and that those equations depend on the material that is being used, on the pretension forces, but in a lot of times, the stress concentration factor is determined experimentally rather than theoretically. 